How can design impact the future? I'd like to talk today about the future of design and the way that designers are combining new technology and discoveries from a variety of fields to reimagine our future objects, experiences, and environments. In my Design Futures Lab, we are developing new scenarios for living. Specifically, we are interested in how design can enable us to think more expansively and more intimately about how it is that we live, how we would like to live, and how we might interact with each other and our environments in the near future. The majority of my work can be considered design research. And one of the most intriguing and rewarding aspects of this job is the ability to design solutions to problems which may be ill-defined or unrecognized by others. I would argue that defining problems is some of the most important work that we do as designers. We then go about trying to solve these problems in ways that are beautiful, thoughtful, and innovative. Design as a process is quite freeform, and it's improvisational, and its reach extends into every facet of our lives. Every object that you touch, interact with, or inhabit in your daily life has been designed somewhere by someone. Design at its best involves thinking deeply and carefully about how it is that we live, our relationships, and our environments. So in thinking about design futures, or how design can help navigate the future, we're interested in discoveries from a wide variety of fields. There are several fields which I feel hold particular promise for the future of design. This would include fields such as artificial intelligence, synthetic biology, neuroscience, robotics, new material science, and biomedical engineering. And discoveries in these fields are happening at a dizzying pace. In light of these discoveries, we are interested in what these impacts may mean when placed in the context of daily human lives and relationships. As design researchers, we are interested in piecing together these new narratives in new contexts. It is this sense-making or storytelling process that is a core focus of our research. So what does design research look like? These are some images taken from my lab this year. Um, and if I had to say one thing that's kind of key to design research, it would be the making of objects. We make a lot of prototypes. And we have a variety of really cool tools that we use. We have things like 3D printers, CNC routers, laser cutters. Uh, we experiment with all different kind of materials. We use a bunch of different software and hardware um, to really just test out our ideas and see how things are going to kind of perform, look, and feel. Um, this is one of our tools. It's a CNC router. Um, and we use this to kind of um, fabricate large-scale objects. And we use this inexpensive pink foam. And in this way, we can kind of cheaply and quickly get a sense of how something's going to look. And then we can kind of start testing it out. Uh, we're also very interested in new material investigations. In the projects I'm going to show you, you'll notice there's um, a lot of different deployment of materials, things like plastics, foams, silicones. And we're also interested in the promise of new materials like biologically embedded substrates. Um, we're also very interested in new formal outcomes, so the way things are going to look or feel. So we use a variety of generative design software um, to really kind of um, come up with novel aesthetics for objects. We're also very interested in novel interaction scenarios. How do we interact with objects in our environment? So we use things like uh, sensors, uh, robotics, microprocessors, electronics, to test out these scenarios. Um, this is a robotic bed under development in my lab, and I'll show this project in a little bit. Um, we have a lot of hands-on research, so we kind of come up with ideas, and then we're really testing them to see what is going to be the best material, the best use of this thing. Um, so now I'd like to show you some projects that were developed in my lab over the past year. Um, these projects were exhibited um, to the public this past summer. And we invited members of the public in to kind of uh, test out the prototypes and get a taste of the design future. The first project I'd like to talk about today is called Scent Message. And this was developed by my graduate student, Laura Naiman. And this project's quite interesting in that it seeks to um, 
look at a new method of communication. So rather than <laughs> using words or images, uh, this project looks to use the medium of scent. This project has two distinct parts. Uh, there's a remote control by which you can send a message, and then there's this large device you see which kind of releases a scent into the environment. And these objects <coughs> would be separated by distance. Um, this is the remote control that we developed, and basically anywhere you touch on this thing, a different color, it will um, respond to your touch and release a corresponding message. And so each color corresponds to a different emotion and a different scent is paired with that. Um, this is the object developed in our lab. Um, for our prototype purposes, we had a library of nine custom scents. We could blend those into thousands of different combinations. Um, for a personal user, as you may be aware, scent is um, very closely tied to human emotion and memory and the way it's able to evoke strong emotions. <coughs> so for this project to kind of be personalized, every individual user, user would have a personal scent library that would be developed based on scents that really kind of <coughs> had an impact on them emotionally. This is the scent delivery device that we prototyped, and this had um, our scent library in it, some motors, fans, and of course it was able to receive the scent messages. One of the really interesting and lovely things about this project is the way that it kind of spreads out uh, a communication. So instead of getting a quick text message on your phone, this um, communication is much less expected, and it's more drawn out in time. So a user would send you this message, and you would kind of be unaware until you felt and smelt um, the scent kind of diffusing through your environment. Then the hope would be that you would kind of have an emotional reaction to that scent, hopefully think back on your partner, and then the scent and the message would kind of gradually diffuse away. <coughs> This is obviously not the most efficient form of communication. One of the interests in my lab is to instead kind of really look at, at alternate, alternative um, potentials of technology in different ways that we can really um, interact with our environment. So the next project I'd like to talk about is called Memory Prod. Um, and this was developed by my graduate student, Sarah Morris. And this project's quite interesting in that it pairs a wearable device that's recording data about your physical state with an audio recorder. And so as you're going about your day, if this device detects high levels of stress, it begins to record a small audio snippet. Um, and you might have seen wearable bands um, on the market now, things like Fitbit that are really popular and they're tracking how much you're sleeping, how much you're moving. This is a similar idea, but pairing it with an audio recording is to kind of act as a, a memory aid to you that perhaps you're going about your day in a somewhat mindless state. This device actually is, is kind of um, in your ear recording things that maybe you're not aware of. and so. There's also this pod that pairs with this, and when you go into this pod later in the day, this pod will play back snippets of audio. And the intention here is that you begin to kind of re recollect some of these key moments in your day and begin to start picking out patterns of how your um, daily interactions are affecting your physical health. So in times of high stress, you might begin to notice your reaction to those moments and try to diffuse them, or vice versa. This thing could be tracking your moments of low stress, and you could start to recognize those moments and kind of amplify them in your daily life. Uh, we imagine these pods to be distributed throughout the city, maybe in parks or at the mall. You could just tuck into one for a few minutes. Um, this is a pod prototype in the gallery. Um, and these were really comfortable. There's like a really nice, comfy, felted interior, it's all padded. I mean, you get in there, it's, it's really fabulous. Um, so one of the funny things about exhibiting our work, we have certain intentions. This was meant to be a solo experience. But <laughs> once we got it out there, you know, people love to kind of congregate in and around this object. Um, so that's a really important piece of our feedback, seeing how people respond to the work and giving us additional insight and ideas about that. Um, the next project I'd like to talk about is called Threshold. Uh, this project was developed by my student Megan Mitchell. And this project is really looking at a new type of vestibule or entry space to your domestic home. 
Um, so instead of just rushing in from work, you're, you're harried, you're stressed, and you know, everyone's like swamping you at the door, this really tries to create a zone, an extended zone with, with a kind of structured processional um, spatial experience that allows you to kind of de-stress and enter your home in a more kind of relaxed and centered state. Um, so this is the object in the gallery, and you enter kind of in that opening. Um, so this journey has four key moments. When you enter this object, uh, the lights will slowly fade on, and they change color, and they get slightly warmer. As you walk a bit further, this gentle breeze of air will blow over you. And that's supposed to be a kind of a symbolic cleansing of your day. You're just kind of like washing it off. Um, as you walk a bit further, there's a seat where you're able to sit down. When you have a seat, the lights will dim, and you're able to kind of take a few moments and just recenter yourself. This object blocks all electronic signals, so there's no cell phone or wireless or anything <laughs> happening in here. It's really just your space. Um, and once you're ready, you can kind of get up to leave, and this device will kind of signal you information about who's already home, any pressing issues that need your attention. <laughs> Um, so this project was very interested in issues of aesthetics and form. And um, we developed this piece. It's made out of um, 600 uh, distinct pieces of polycarbonate plastic that were cut out, folded, and assembled together. And when you're inside of this, it's a really beautiful quality of kind of light and color playing off of each other. It's very quiet, very serene. Um, and it's just a nice way to kind of use technology, not to kind of add to your life, but instead to filter out um, and kind of uh, slow down. That's where you exit the object. Uh, the next project I'd like to talk about is called Sleeping Terrain, and I showed you a bit of that earlier. This project is basically a fully interactive bed, um, a sleep surface that can kind of respond to you and kind of move up and down. This was developed by my graduate student, Katie McHugh. Um, and this is the project installed in the gallery. And you can see these kind of bumps, and they kind of rise and fall. Um, and basically, with this project, we were really interested in the potential of sensors in our environment, which are forecast to, to increase um, exponentially in the next few years. And basically, what happens if we pair sensors with this very essential human activity of sleep? Um, what would result? And so this is a, some diagrams of, of how the project is able to reconfigure itself. It's highly customizable. It can be programmed to accept a variety of inputs. Some of the ideas we were thinking about was, say, you're in a partnered relationship. Your partner is snoring. This bed could detect those sound levels, slowly nudge them to kind of roll over <laughs> without, <laughs> without disturbing the other party. <laughs> or in a healthcare setting, we could have something like um, a bedridden patient. This could gently kind of reposition them throughout the day to alleviate bed sores. So this has a whole host of possibilities. Um, the surface of this, although this was very technologically um, kind of complicated, it was also really um, interested, this project, in terms of like how things feel and how this surface kind of moves and reacts. Um, and it, the silicone that we used for this was just, it was a really lovely material. Um, we custom poured it. It was this huge membrane. We embedded sensors within it. And it had a really lovely uh, quality. It transmitted heat. Um, it stretched. And so I think it was a really nice kind of combination of materials with technology. Here's Katie, the student, demonstrating the bed. You can see that part kind of depressed. And this was a really <laughs> popular. Um, peace with visitors of all ages. And it was great to see people get on top of this thing, kind of interact with it, and, and really kind of discover the potential of this object. Uh, the last project I'd like to talk about today is called Resurface. And this project uh, was developed by my graduate student, Tasha Tucker. This project looks the furthest to the future of all the projects in the lab this year. And basically, this project is looking to consider the impact of synthetic biology in our interior environments. <laughs> So for this project, we basically came up with a showroom of products for the future. So we had a um, sample kitchen countertop surface, a wall surface, and a flooring surface. And we prototyped each of those for the gallery exhibit and looking at kind of how bacteria might come into play in those surfaces in the future. Um, this is a developmental issue 
image of the wall surface, and we were working with a swarm behavior expert, a scientist, who helped us program the behavior of this bacterial swarm. And what we really wanted to have was an interactive um, device that could sense the movement of your arm, react to kind of changing light levels, and form these kind of apertures, almost opening holes like as if it, it's a window. And so this is the piece in the gallery. Users would kind of wave their arm around, and the swarm would kind of follow that and kind of spread open and then come back together again. This is a close-up image of that, and you can see that kind of lovely hole opening up. Um, and this was a really mesmerizing project. I spent a lot of time in the gallery just kind of uh, <laughs> playing with this one. <laughs> um, so you might notice the surface of this project is quite unusual. This was actually a bacterial cellulose that we developed in the lab. This is a new material that's getting a lot of attention, um, particularly in medical applications. And how this is made, you actually ferment this kind of bacterial soup. And after a while, there's this skin that forms. We take that skin, we dry it out, and then you're left with this very hard, kind of papery, leathery surface. It's very strong. And it's very interesting um, kind of new material. Uh, the next surface that we were working on was a kitchen countertop surface. For this, we were looking at a kitchen countertop that could potentially sense uh, pesticides, allergens, pathogens, GMOs, and change color in response to specific um, contaminants that it was detecting. So in the gallery, we had a video projection um, that was kind of simulating the presence of like an apple, bread, or raw chicken, and the bacteria was kind of swarming and changing color in response. The last um, piece in this exhibit was the flooring surface. And this was simulating uh, bacteria that would kind of exfoliate your feet, absorb dander and odor. And what users would do, they would step on this platform and bacteria would kind of appear to swarm around them with these kind of colors here. Um, and this was a very popular piece of our exhibit as well. Um, users were a little squeamish about, you know, <laughs> bacteria being so visible in our environments, but I really like this as a kind of thought experiment in terms of how we might really envision these things in the near future. So in conclusion, um, in looking to enable a more nuanced, thoughtful, and fulfilling set of human experiences, design can enhance and enrich our life in a variety of beautiful and poetic ways. I hope this talk has provided you with an enticing glimpse into our nearly designed future. Thank you so much.